Recovery Lecture Series, and this is the Students in Recovery. The third night has sponsors just like the first two nights, and tonight's sponsor is Favor, Faces and Voices of Recovery. So they've asked for about five minutes, so here they are. Good evening. My name is Victor Archambault. I'm a physician, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. That means I've been without drugs or alcohol for over 20 years. And I'm here tonight representing Faces and Voices of Recovery. This is a group that is dedicated to supporting people in recovery, people seeking recovery, and the families and friends of people in recovery. Uh, helping those people to find the resources and, and, and the um, find and access the resources they need to be successful in their attempt to gain long-term recovery. Um, we started nationally about 15 years ago and our local chapter just started in 2012. Um, we have basically three goals. One is to support the addict or alcoholic who is in recovery. Um, the second is to help educate the public that we do recover. The old adage, once an addict, always an addict, a drunk is a drunk is a drunk, a leopard can't change its spots. Those have been proven to be lies. We do recover. And there are 23 and a half million of us in long-term recovery. And the third aspect of our goals is to help our legislators to make sane and reasonable laws regarding recovery and how we treat people in recovery. Uh, so we have some brochures at the back if you'd like to pick one up. We encourage you to help support this movement because we have a message to carry to the world. We do recover. Thanks for your time. Okay. I'm another member of Favor. My name's Jim. I've been around a while, as, just as Doc has. Uh, one of the things that we are doing this year as part of that education and advocacy goal that we uh, pursue in Favor is to present the film, the anonymous, I'm sorry, I said film. It's so hard for me not to say film. It's not on film, it's digital, but it's a movie. So we're going to present the movie, The Anonymous People. It's going to be a week from tonight. It'll be at 7 o'clock, just like, just like tonight, except uh, uh, we'll, we'll still have dinner over in the, in the Cafe 1100. And if any of you have ever been to the Trestle, and enjoyed it, then you'll want to come back next week at 6 o'clock. So there's the, there's the commercial for dinner. You know, you feel, if you feed them, they'll come to the program, whatever the program is. So that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, let me show you something real quick here, if I can make it come up without messing up everything. Whether we want to admit this or not, this is our black plague. There's 25 million people that suffer from this illness. We have an epidemic. It's a national crisis that untreated addiction cost our economy over $550 billion last year. It is disgraceful that we have done so little about it thus far. Once you're an addict, you're that thing that they have to have. So many people think of addicts as homeless people living under bridges. The media is difficult for us to battle against because the negative news about addiction is dramatic. You know what we in the media do? We wink, wink it. We snoop dog it. Hey, oh yeah, they're stoned. That's fine. If everyone thinks of alcoholism and addiction as a negative thing, no one's going to want to go get help. As a culture, we are still very rooted in just say no. Drugs are menacing our society. We're going to try to incarcerate our way out of the addiction problem. Our jails are full of addicts and alcoholics. They're all pulled up in one spot. When you're caught, you will do time. Recovery is what you need, not prison. Hello? Alcoholism has too long been a taboo subject. The shame and secrecy are just as deadly as the disease itself. Our numbers are unbelievably strong, but yet we have no voice. We know about every issue out there, 
But people don't know how important the issue of recovery is. As a person in long-term recovery from an illness that has no cure, but an illness that has a solution. If we could ever tap those 20 million people in long-term recovery, you change this overnight. Now it's my turn to teach you that recovery works. History's on our side. History will show one day who and what we are. So I say we make history. Voices are out there. We have to find and open the hearts. And I think those hearts want to be open. I refuse to feel ashamed of who I am. I most certainly will not be embarrassed that I'm an addict. I'm going to tell whoever I damn well want to. There's a lot of us. Everyone knows somebody. Well, that's the commercial for it. I hope you'll come back next week and uh, see the whole movie, eat dinner with us, uh, maybe learn a little bit more about Favor, uh, have the opportunity maybe to join Favor. You might see that there's something something that you can add to this. Uh, we don't need to let uh, the news media define us by uh, only showing pictures of the people that kill themselves who are famous, and we don't don't need to we don't need to sit sit by and let only the bad side of this of of this situation um, be made public. So uh, next week, 7 p.m. in here, dinner at 6 p.m. Tickets are free. Please come back and bring two or three friends with you. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Um, when I organize this lecture series every year, this is the seventh year that I've organized it, and there's three parts to it. And for the third part, I wanted to share with you what I put out for the students. Now, what I learned the first six years is you don't put these in the hallway, you put them in the bathrooms. So. Because the, the ones in the hallway, you might find one tag that's taken, but in the bathrooms, they're almost all taken. So, and it's phenomenal. Because tomorrow, I'll go back when I see them around, the, in, around campus, not in the girls' bathrooms, but in the, in the boys' bathrooms. I'll, I'll take them down, and almost always, the tags are gone. So, tonight, you're going to hear from six students who have responded. And what they've done is they contacted me, and I interviewed them, which means they sat down, and they told me their 10-minute story. And so I'm going to ask Walt, Corey, and Ricky to come on up and take your place at the table. I can guarantee you that we're all nervous. I can guarantee you. So um, I'll let them tell you their stories. They're going to do it 10 or 15 minutes at a time from start to finish. Um, and then after this group of students, we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll come back and you'll hear the second group of three students. All right, so please welcome Walt, Corey, and Ricky. Hello, everybody. My name is Walt. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I guess I'll start with my childhood. It was just a pretty normal childhood. Um, I grew up, I was adopted with two adopted, a brother and a sister. Um, I didn't grow up in a home with alcohol. There wasn't any. Um, I didn't party in high school, didn't drink. My first drink was when I joined the military. And then I was just a pretty social drinker, you know, once or twice a month, go out on the weekend, have a good old time. And uh, that went on for, I don't know, 10 years probably. 
And then I got divorced. And then I drank a lot. And it wasn't because I was depressed. I was celebrating. <laughs> so I found out from getting married at 17 and not doing any of that stuff. I, at 30 years old, I was having a grand old time. I was partying all the time. And uh, I didn't drink in work. I just drank after work and on the weekends. And, uh, and then that progressed. And then I got remarried. And then got divorced. And then I did drink because I was depressed. I cra crawled into that bottle and, and stayed there for about four years. And uh, my, my drinking had progressed to where I was drinking a half a gallon of whiskey or vodka every day. From the moment I woke up, brush my teeth, throw up, and then have a drink. And I'd sip on that until I passed out, and then I'd do it all over again. Um, the last six months of my drinking, I would uh, hooked up with this lady that just wanted to have a good time, so and we just hung out and drank, and she made sure I had a fresh bottle every day. And uh, a couple months into that, you know, I, I was really physically wore down, started throwing up blood, having blood in my stool. Of course, I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's, it'll, it'll be okay. Um, and then one day a friend of mine came over and she took one look at me and she said, Walt, get ready, we're going to the hospital. I said, okay, let me fix a drink. So I fixed myself a drink and we headed to the hospital. Um, got to the hospital, you know, got admitted. Um, I remember about two hours of that. And then I guess I went into full-blown DTs. About six o'clock, everything went crazy. My blood pressure was crazy. My pulse was crazy. Um, I'd lost so much blood. I died. My heart stopped. I was, I was gone for about four and a half minutes. And um, there, there's a reason I'm, I'm back here. The good Lord brought me back. And uh, I think I had my spiritual awakening when I was in a coma. But I was very, very lucky <laughs> that um, I'm a veteran, so the VA took great care of me. I was blessed. To, I actually did 16 months of inpatient care. I did 28 days. They offered me a 90-day program. I did that. They offered me a year-long program, which was a work-study kind of thing to get you back to work in it while you're in recovery. And uh, I finished that. And two months after that, I got hired back at the VA. I'm a peer specialist. I spend every day working with people with addiction, alcoholism, homelessness, everything like that. So I'm very, very blessed. Thank you for letting me to share. Well, hello, everyone. I'm actually here to talk to you about something a little different today. Two years ago, as I am today, I was six foot four and weighed 135 pounds. I was dying of malnutrition caused by a mental illness known as anorexia nervosa. This is my story. Growing up, I had a pretty normal childhood. My brother was an all-star athlete. I too showed a lot of promise. Um, in terms of becoming an athlete until I was in about second grade and um, my gym teacher, physical education teacher, noticed that um, I was doing some tics like with my eyes and with my shoulders and uh, that was from something called Tourette syndrome. And as I grew up, it progressed worse and worse and it started to really have an effect on my life. I was made fun of a lot as a kid, bullied, my group of friends certainly were not the popular kids, and most of them had issues of their own. And I really never really found my place in life. My brother was this all-star athlete, tons of friends, went to all the parties and stuff, and I was just kind of a loser, and I always kind of felt inferior to him. So. That's kind of how I went on through junior high, and um, in high school, I did meet a girl, spoiler alert, not the one that came with me today, and um, that started probably the worst five years of my life. 
It was a very verbally abusive relationship. She put me down a lot, made me feel inferior to her, insignificant to her, made me feel like it was a privilege to just be with her. And that was just absolutely devastating on my self-esteem. When I was in college, I was working full time throughout it and didn't really have a whole lot of fun and that just made me feel terrible. While my classmates were out partying and socializing, I was working in a Kroger gas station in one of those bulletproof boxes, just all alone. And about that time, I started to get into like fitness and nutrition. At first it just started off with, you know, going on websites, reading things about nutrition. There is an incredible amount of info there. Reading about exercise, trying new exercises, and it was such an amazing escape. You can really focus your whole day on what you're gonna eat, how you're gonna prepare it, when you're gonna exercise, how much to do. It's, it can absolutely become an addiction, and it did for me. And um, after graduating from college, I made a terrible mistake of getting a job at Abercrombie & Fitch Corporate Office, which was an uh, extremely triggering environment for someone who was having body image issues. I mean, there was literally pictures of naked, muscular men on the walls in the corporate office, and it was a place where you had to walk the walk and talk the talk and look the look and drink the corporate Kool-Aid to fit in. And um, me, as a person who was becoming more and more skinny, I was just I was just never going to fit in, and that also made me feel like an outsider. At my very worst, like I said, I was six foot four, 135 pounds. My skin was turning yellow from jaundice, and I guess I hit rock, rock bottom one day when I was at the gym at work running on a treadmill, and I passed out. Luckily. No one really noticed, so I got back up and I finished my run. Um, and during this, family and friends were becoming more and more concerned and um, finally I started to look into getting treatment. Uh, to be honest with you, this period of my life, my memory is kind of fuzzy, just due to how malnourished I was. Um, I don't really remember a whole lot about it, but I do remember starting treatment and being very scared, afraid, and just kind of not sure what it would be like. But there was one thing that I knew, and that was that I was not gonna waste anyone's time, and that I was gonna work harder in treatment than I did when I was working 40 hours a week and going to school full time. So I uh, started treatment, and I was in there for six months, and um, it was a very humbling experience. I walked in on the first day and was just like, oh my God, there's all these crazy skinny people running around. Well, I was much worse off than all of they were. I just didn't know it at the time. But I mean, I learned, I learned how to eat a balanced diet. I learned how to exercise in moderation. I learned how to have self-esteem, how to have self-worth. I learned how to make friends and how to socialize. And I learned about some of the underlying issues that I had been covering up with my eating disorder. And um, I had to work my ass off, that's for sure. At one point I was eating like 5,000 calories a day to try to gain weight and from someone, you know, as someone who before was eating like a thousand, that was just quite a shock to me. But um, I made it through, and uh, I'm here today. I'm uh, happily to, I'm happily engaged to a girl who was not my uh, crazy ex-girlfriend. So I made it. But um, there was definitely a few things I learned while in treatment that um, I think were the real takeaways for me. One was that. While I was in treatment, I was going to work 
as hard as I possibly could. It would have been a waste of my time, insurance money, and the therapist and doctor's time if I didn't. Another thing was I had to accept that I had a mental illness. It's no different than someone who has diabetes. Someone who has diabetes has to go get insulin and go to the doctor and monitor their insulin levels. I too had to go to the doctor and keep track of what I was eating. It was no different. I had a disease. Um, another takeaway I had was that I had to kind of make treatment fun for myself. I kind of had to take a hold of it and make it my own. When we were sitting around on our uh, on our meals that were observed, uh, we always pretended they were dinner parties. And I would sit at the head of the table and say, oh, I'm so glad that all of you joined us here today. Uh, I think I forgot the Dom Perignon again, but I'll have it next time, you know? So we, we made it fun. And it was, it was a horrible experience. We were all scared to death, but we made it fun. And another thing I learned was that I had self-worth. I was worth recovering and living a good life, and that I discovered who I was underneath my addiction. I discovered that I liked cars, and I liked riding my bike in moderation, and I did like running, but if my knee hurt, I would actually stop. And I replaced my addiction with doing things in moderation. I didn't replace it with drinking 20 cups of coffee a day like some people I knew. I didn't replace it by going tanning five times a day. I replaced it by doing all those things in moderation. And really moderation and balance was kind of the whole theme of my recovery. It was okay to exercise in moderation. It was okay to eat any food in moderation. It was okay to socialize in moderation. Everything in balance and in moderation. And that's what basically allowed me to live the great life I'm living today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ricky. I'm an addict. Um, I guess I'll start off in the beginning. Um, can't say that I had any real traumatic childhood or anything. Life was pretty normal. Um, I did wonderful in school up until about middle school. Um, I had straight A's across the board. I was in the GATE program, which is gifted and talented education, kind of like honors. Um, I was in honor classes, too, in middle school. And then it all went a little sideways from there. Um, my brother was about two years older than me, and I, he was in middle school with me too, and I started to hang out with him and all his older friends, and um, just trying to fit in with the older crowd, um, started drinking, started smoking weed, and started smoking weed every day, all day long. Um, and doing things I definitely shouldn't have to be able to get the money to do that. Um, which, at the age of 17, landed me up in prison for a year and a half. Um, in that year and a half when I was in prison, um, they had an intensive, in, uh, I guess it's intensive inpatient program there. We went to um, three counseling sessions a day. Um, and that was the entire time I was there. Um, and when I was released, I was released on seven years of parole. And any normal person with years of parole hanging over their head and just going through treatment would have stopped. Well, I didn't. Um, on parole, having to report every month and was still at the same rate that I was before. Started doing even more things than I was. Um, and. I lasted for a while, um, getting by, you know, drinking things to cover up my my tests, and you know, just praying that when I went there, they wouldn't drug test me this time. And um, I landed up spending so much money on on drugs that I wasn't able to pay the restitution that I owed. And they sent me to Charleston to a restitution center where you essentially like a work release where you stay there and you go to work during the day. And I lasted, I, th 
a few months there, um, and then the place I was working, one of the guys there smoked, and I ended up smoking with him, came back to the place one day, and it was random drug test day, failed it, and got handcuffs on. And because of that, I violated my parole and was sentenced to another year in prison. Um, did that, got back out, still didn't learn my lesson. Um, and, you know, sometimes I, I think to myself, like now that I'm in recovery, I think to myself, well, maybe I wasn't an addict. But when I look back at it, there's, as soon as I look back and think of the things that I've done and the stuff that I went through, there's no question in my mind. Um, you know, so I got out and, I mean, during this time, um, you know, they made me report to, you know, 12-step programs, and none of that actually worked for me, um, only because I didn't really want it to work. You know, I wasn't willing to give up what I was doing, um, and my addiction progressively got worse. Um, I mean, I've probably done and tried just about any drug you can think of. Um, and what happened was, was my drug of choice is marijuana, but I've done everything else um, and had binges here and there with different things. But this new stuff came out um, called Spice, K2, synthetic marijuana, whatever you want to call it. And it went from, you know, not being able to find drugs sometimes, um, so with the ease and availability of that stuff, I just transferred over and it worked. Um, granted, it worked better than the weed. It got to the point where I didn't even smoke weed anymore because the other stuff worked so good. But the problem was, was I was spending probably 80 to $120 a day on it. Um, I would smoke from the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep, like any single function that I did. If I was going to the bathroom, I was smoking. If I was going to the store, I was smoking. If I was doing anything, it was to the point where I needed to get high first. And I would literally wake up in the middle of the night, like every night, like clockwork, and get sick from smoking that stuff. Um, because nobody really, I mean, I guess the people that make it know what's in it, but when you buy that stuff, you don't know what's in it. There's no regulation on it. There's no, there's no anything on it except for what the people make it and put in it. And luckily for me, I mean, I had those, I had the ill side effects of, you know, getting sick at night, not being able to sleep. Um, and when I woke up in the middle of the night, I would get sick and smoke it again just to feel better. Um, it definitely had very bad withdrawal symptoms. Um, and it got to the point where I, I really wasn't even getting high anymore. It was almost just like repetition. And I finally decided to do something about it. And I was able to get clean and stayed clean for about 90 days or so. And then I was going on a um, vacation to Florida. And the whole road trip thing, vacation, just triggered me. And I went and got more and went back to it for about three or four months and just got tired of it. And it was to the point where I went and bought it one day and smoked it and smoked all of it. And just it just didn't work anymore. And at that point, I was just tired of it. And I finally decided to do something about it and quit. And when I quit, the the side effects of that stuff were nasty. Like, literally for a week after stopping, I wasn't even able to eat. Like, I was hungry, and as soon as I would start to try to eat something, I just could not eat. Um, couldn't sleep right, um, and it took me it took me a good week just to to get back in any sort of normal state. Um, and I'm lucky because I mean I read in the news about people that have smoked that and had massive brain problems, heart attacks, and just all sorts of really bad health-related problems. I mean, people have even died from it. So I'm definitely lucky in that aspect. Um, and in the end, I mean, I, I found the program that works for me. Um, I 
go there pretty much every day. Um, I have a network of people that if I have a bad day and feel like something's going wrong, I can call them and they're there to offer their support and tell me how they were able to get through what I'm going through because they've been there and done that. Um, and it's definitely working so far and I think that's about all I got. Thank you. Are there any questions? I had two questions. Well, when you told me your story, uh, you, you mentioned going to the hospital and, and you mentioned the DTs. Could you elaborate on the DTs? Well, like I said, I don't remember a lot. There's, there's two things I remember from, be, from the DTs. One, there was a picture on the wall. And I don't even know if that picture was there, but I'm laying on this stretcher and I'm strapped down with four, four point restraints and I'm fighting them the whole time. And, for, and I look up at this picture and my friend's face is in the picture. And I keep saying, give me that knife. Give me that knife. Throw me the knife. I don't care if you stab me with it, just give me that damn knife. And uh, that went on for a while. The other thing I would, the, that was terrifying, I was laying in a stretcher, the ground was like clear plexiglass. My restraints weren't restraints, they were chains. And I could see people underneath the ground with computers and stuff, and they were, in my mind, they were, they were terrorists planning the terror attack. And then that turned into a swimming pool, and somebody was going to push me in the pool with my chains on. That's really the only thing I remember of the DTs. Um, I've been told a lot of other things that I did. Um, uh, I got out of the restraints and security had to come and apparently they, you know, they said I was combative, I was fighting everybody. And uh, my friend said it, I just kind of snapped up in a kind of a lucid moment and said, look, I just want to take a shit. <laughs> so, um, but I don't remember a lot, like I said. Um, my friends tell me stories and they, you know, we laugh at it now, but it was, it was, it was bad. And I don't think you mentioned your sobriety date. Oh, I'm sorry. August 2nd, 2011. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Elaine? Uh, Corey, because it's so unusual uh, for me to hear men that struggle with an eating disorder, um, uh, do you thought, like, was there any aftercare that you continue to use? And <clears throat> have you found, uh, how do I say this right? I, I've, str ha uh, I've struggled with an eating disorder also, so I can, I can identify with you. Um, have you found some of the, so how to say this, um, like, it occurring <clears throat> back with you? Because I've struggled off and on for a lot of years with mine. I don't know whether there's behaviors that come back that are, like, indicative. Like, like relapse. Corey, could you repeat that question for the live stream so they can hear it? Yeah, yeah. So she was basically just asking me um, if 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 there's what still any triggers and behaviors that that still happen to me that are you know eating disorder behaviors. And um, the answer is yes. Uh, they don't happen very often, but from the treatment I received, I can identify them as soon as they happen, and just from all the education I've gone through it, learning about the disorder, about my disease, I can identify that, okay, yes, that is an eating disorder behavior, and okay, no, it's a normal behavior, or I guess not, nothing's a normal behavior, but a non-eating disorder behavior, and um, if I do have a behavior that is one, um, I have a huge network of friends that I met in treatment, um, it, was in, it was in Ohio that I got treatment at, and I'm still friends with a lot of the people I was in treatment with. I mean, my phone's basically a Rolodex of people I can text and say, hey, you know, I'm having a bad day. Hey, should I go on an eight-day juice fast? Or, hey, do you think it'd be a good idea to train for a marathon? And they're usually like, you know what? That's probably not such a good idea. So, yeah. Corey, do you have a 12-step program or a program that you went through in the steps? 
No, it, it was not a 12-step program. It was a, uh, it's called a uh, partial hospitalization program. So we would go in and we would eat two meals and two snacks monitored. Um, we would have group therapy and in-person therapy. And then um, when we were released to go home, we would have um, meals that we were that we had to eat by ourselves and we also had exercise plans that kind of let us know how much we could exercise and when and so I just went through that and as I was in there longer they kept increasing my meal plan until I was gaining weight and then they lowered my meal plan and I could start exercising more and like I said six months later I was to the point where I could manage it on my own but it's, it's a different amount of time for everyone who went into treatment depending on how bad they were uh, when they started. Um, I, I guess I guess it's not treated the same way as like an alcohol or drug addiction is with the step program. It's more like it's more exposure therapy and um, dialectic behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. It's it's more like that, yeah. Uh, six months. Yeah. Yeah. So I had like I had like forty five pounds to gain that you know I had to do before that I could be released. So yeah. I have a question for Ricky. When when you were telling me your story, um, you mentioned the run in with the Surfside Police. Oh yes. Could you could you elaborate? <laughs> um. One of the major reasons that I, I changed over from smoking marijuana to smoking the, the spice stuff was legality and availability. Um, I could go to the store and just walk in and buy it. Um, I didn't have to go find the drug dealer and go and worry about getting pulled over or going back to jail for it. Um, it was legal and readily available. So um, there was a store in Surfside that sold it. Um, I don't keep up whether they do or not anymore, but I went there one day and went inside and purchased it and left. And I was leaving the place and had packed the bowl and was ready to smoke it and was driving and noticed a police officer behind me. And he cut his lights off and cut him back on. And I was wondering what he was doing because he didn't blue light me, but a couple seconds later, the blue lights came on. He was checking, and my tag was out on my car, the the license plate lamp. So he pulled me over for that, and I guess because of the place I was leaving, probably they had some suspicion that I probably had something on me, um, and they wanted to search the vehicle. Well, I knew I didn't have anything illegal on me, so I, I let him search the vehicle, and in the door was my pipe that was packed full of the stuff, and they found it, and this pipe had never been used for anything else, so um, essentially they took it, they put it in their little test kit, and it came back negative for marijuana, and essentially there was nothing that they could do about it but let me go because in the law's eyes, the stuff was legal, and there, there was just nothing they could do about it. They, you know, they tried to tell me that what I was doing was wrong and I shouldn't be doing it and all that stuff. But in the end, they simply wrote me a warning for my license plate lamp and let me go. Um, <clears throat> and the major problem with that stuff is I haven't been keeping up on it at, at all. But the major problem with that stuff was um, the legislature to make it illegal. They would simply make the chemical compound, the synthetic marijuana compound in it illegal, and then chemists would simply change a molecule or two here or there, which would make it become a, another chemical compound, which wasn't illegal. And so they were getting through loopholes in the law, and as soon as one became illegal, they would just make another one and make it legal. Um, I don't know what's happened since then, if they've put a figured out a way to make a, a, a blanket ban on it to make all of them illegal or not, but at the time it was totally legal. That's all my questions. Anybody else got any questions? Yeah, this question's for Walt, um, also being a, uh, 
This question is for Walt. Uh, also, being a veteran myself and a recovering alcoholic, uh, you mentioned something about working peer to peer with other people coming back and uh, other veterans. Could you expand on that just a little bit? Well, the VA um, about a year and a half ago mandated that uh, they would hire peer specialists in the mental health departments. They hired, they had a mandate to hire 800 by, I think it was November of last year, uh, they hired 1,000. The requirements to have that position is one, be a veteran. Two, you have to have been in recovery from a mental illness or a substance abuse problem. First job you ever get that you had to be an alcoholic. <laughs> and uh, go through a peer certification training. And uh, mine, they hired me as an apprentice, so they sent me to the training, um, and uh, we they station us, you know, wherever the need is. I work in the HUD Vash homeless program. Um, my two friends in the audience they work in general mental health. Um, what we do is we help our fellow vet veterans with their mental health issues through our lived experiences. They've been here, done that thing, so we connect with them on a level that their therapist doesn't or can't. Um, I know I feel more comfortable talking to my buddy or my friend or my fellow, fellow veteran than I do the, the doctor. So that, that's what we do. And uh, very blessed to be able to do it. Thank you. Okay, let's give them a round of applause. And we'll take a 10 minute break.
All right, let me have your attention. Let's go ahead and have a seat. All right, um, I think most of us are, are back. I'll wait just a minute. Um, could you go ahead and get the lights in the back? Can you hear? Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and call down the second group of students, Mackenzie, Kathy, and Kevin. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. Um, I'm really nervous right now, so you guys just bear with me. I just had to call my mom, and she prayed for me over the phone, so I'm struggling right now. Um, I'm really young, obviously. I'm only 18. Um, when I grew up, um, my I was raised mostly by a single mother. Um, there's four of us. Um, my biological father is a current alcoholic and drug addict. Um, my sister's biological father is a recovering alcoholic. And the man that my mom is married to right now, who I consider to be my real father, um, he is a recovering drug addict and al alcoholic as well. So I grew up around addiction. And um, to me, it was something that w seemed very normal. Um, I didn't ever see that there was something wrong with that kind of behavior because I saw adults doing it all the time. Um, I, because I'd never had a, a father figure in my life that was always around, I started having really bad self-esteem issues when I was in the sixth grade. And um, I was a twig. I was probably half the size that I am now. And I thought that I was extremely fat. And um, it got worse when I was in eighth grade, and that was the first time that I ever hurt myself. Um, and that didn't become a problem for me until I was a freshman in high school. And that was when I hurt myself every single day. Um, it became something that was kind of a punishment for me. Um, I hated the person that I was. Um, I didn't have good relationships with anyone in my family, and that was because I struggled so much internally. And they say that you can't love anyone else if you don't love yourself, and that was a big issue for me. Um, so when I was upset, I would hurt myself. If I was sad, I would hurt myself. Um, if I got in a fight with my mom, I would comfort myself with the thought that I can just go home and I can hurt myself. And, and that was something that seemed refreshing to me. It was something that I liked the thought of. Um, I did that for about a year, and my mom found out accidentally and I had to stop for a period of time because she would check every single day. And she checked in the spots that she, that seemed like the most normal spots. So she checked my arms and she checked my thighs. And eventually she thought, okay, she's fine. She's not doing any more. There's no more fresh marks. So I'll just stop checking. And so that was when I started again. And I got smarter about it. And I did it in places that I knew she would never look again. So I started doing it on my sides. Um, I would do it on the inside of my thighs where I know she wouldn't look. And um, today I'm covered for the most part in scars. Um, I have words written on my thighs. Um, and fortunately for me, I discovered the foundation to write love on her arms which is an unbelievable foundation 
And hearing the story of Renee, who they based the foundation off of, um, knowing that someone else went through something like this as well and that she was able to stop doing that, that made me want to stop as well. I didn't want to have more of these scars on my body because they're not very pretty looking. Um, so I stopped hurting myself. But unfortunately, I didn't really um, attack the issue that was going on. So even though I stopped hurting myself, I was still struggling a lot with my self-worth, with the fact that my biological father didn't want anything to do with me, um, with the fact that my mom was married to another addict who um, his addictions took over all of her time and her energy. So I replaced hurting myself with pills. And um, the first time I ever tried them, I was just kind of hooked on it. I liked that it kind of made me forget about everything that was happening. And I liked that it was so easy for me to get a hold of because there was an addict in my house who was using them as well. And so I would steal them from him. Um, I got allowance every week for taking care of my brother's cat. And I would use that money to purchase them on my own. And when my mom would ask me, you know, where's all this money going? Why don't you, you know, why don't you have any? I would just say, oh, I had to pay so-and-so back for this. Or, oh, I had to buy this for school. And she just never picked up on it. And um, the first time that I ever overdosed, my dad found me in the bathroom floor. And I don't remember this moment very well, but I've heard stories of it. And I do remember the first, he saw me and the first thing he said was, how many did you take? And because he was an addict himself, he could recognize exactly what I was doing. And I had taken over 20 Vicodins. And um, I remember him carrying me down the stairs and he was saying, I don't think she's gonna make it. I don't think she is. And they were about to take me to the hospital until I started throwing everything up. And my mom, who was in the medical field, said, okay, she's throwing all of this up, so that's good. So they just let me get it all out of my system. And then that night, I had to sleep with my parents, who throughout the night made me respond to them to make sure that I was still alive. And after that, um, that didn't really do anything for me. Um, I continued on using, and um, eventually it got to the point where I couldn't even walk up the stairs without passing out. Um, my body just couldn't handle everything that I was doing to it. And my stepfather went through a program, it's called Hebron Colony Ministries, and it's a religious-based um, facility. And they have a female version of it in another state. And my parents um, brought a brochure to me and they said, you either stop what you're doing or you're going to this place. And um, I'm a very social person. I like being around people and I did not like the thought of being sent away somewhere, away from my family and my friends. So I told them, okay, I'll stop. Um, I was kind of put on lockdown. Um, I had to go to Hebron every single weekend, so I was around men who had been addicts for three times the amount of time that I've ever used. And being in a place where there are these men who are doing everything that they can to become better, and having these conversations with them about their struggle and where they are now, it was so inspiring to me. And I thought, if these men who have been addicts for 20 some years, doing stuff way worse than I can, can stop, then so can I. So um, with the help of being around those people, um, I was put into therapy, who I had an amazing psychologist who, um, taught me how to recognize my triggers, um, taught me ways to cope with the moments when um, I want to relapse. Um, those things were ultimately what made me be able to stop. Um, I have an amazing support system. My family um, are so good to me and are always there. Um, and 
having an amazing relationship with God has um, got me through this. Um, I, I really owe it to those things. And on days when I, I feel like it's just too much and I, I don't want to keep trying anymore, I think of this conversation that I had with my sister. Um, she's a few years younger than me and she's my absolute best friend. And she is tied to my hip and wants to do whatever I do. And when I was going through my addictions, um, her and I had a really bad relationship. And one day, her and I were just goofing off and having a good time together. And she got really serious. And she looked at me and said, please don't ever go back to that person that you used to be. She said, I didn't like what you were doing then. And I want you to stay like you are now. So when I have those moments where I just want to give up and stop trying, I think of my little sister and um, how much I hurt her when I was using and how much um, she needs me now. So thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy, and this is the first time that I've shared my story in a, in a group. And I have to use a little cheat sheet because I'm not as good as these guys, but maybe I'll get to know it at one time. I moved here to Myrtle Beach in the early 80s, and in 1983, I figured out there was something wrong with me. So I came to Tech. I started taking um, psychology classes and abnormal psychology classes. And then I transferred over to Coastal Carolina, majoring in physical education. And my life was a run, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. I, um, I did martial arts. I did work study, uh, modern dance classes. And I worked banquets. And banquet work supported an eating disorder that I developed in my early teens. Um, when I was a teenager, I ran track, and I ran track after, I ran after I ate dinner, and I automatically threw up. So throwing up was easy for me. A lot of people who are bulimic have to put their hands down their throats or do other things. I never, I never did. And actually, I did this to the point that you have a um, sphincter in your throat, which keeps your food down. Mine works both ways, and it got to the point that it was easier for me to throw up than to keep my food down. Um, some of the side effects become with enamel comes off your teeth and a lot of dental stuff. So now I move on to my early 20s. In my early 20s, I started seeing a therapist and she had me start or helped me start a self-help group at Coastal for people with eating disorders. And one of the girls in the group was going to Charleston and they were testing medications for eating disorders. They were to testing something, I think it's called Tofanol. It's an old-timey antidepressant, and they don't use it anymore, but it has a lot of side effects. And one of the side effects I had from it is that I would I'd fall asleep at traffic lights. And they say antidepressants don't make you suicidal, but some of the old-timey, I believe some of the old-timey ones do because they, they don't use them anymore. But um, with an eating disorder, it's downward spiraling. It just gets worse, progressively worse. And one morning, well, I was going to Charleston, and, and they didn't want me to drive there every week to get medicine. So they gave me a prescription, so I got three months' prescriptions of the antidepressants. I filled them all, and I took them all. And um, I ended up going to the emergency room. And, well, before... Before, when I, before I went there, I was in bed crying, and I was asking God if he wanted, to be, he wanted me to be here to tell me what it was he wanted to, me to do. And when I went to the, the hospital, I remember the nurse saying, why are all these young girls committing suicide? And I thought to myself, why? It's because we give up. Um, when I was in the hospital, I couldn't remember my name or my phone number or any of that stuff, and... Finally, my, my memory came back a little bit, and I dialed the number, and my roommate came and got me, and I walked out. I never got a hospital bill. I just got an ambulance bill. And um, then I went back to school like nothing had happened. Usually if you, go, if you overdose or something, they keep you for a few days to make sure that you're stable. Um, 
when I was back at Coastal, I was walking around the college, you know, just thinking about my life and stuff, and I walked into one of these trailers that was in, where they had exchange students. I walked in there and talked to them about being an exchange student. I filled out some paperwork. And I was gone in two weeks. I was gone to Malta in the Mediterranean. Um, and Malta, I was still very sick. And um, I was sick to the point that I wasn't staying in a flat. And that's kind of like apartment, but, but they call it a flat over there. And we had one bathroom, and all of us had rooms. I was so sick that I would get cooking pots out of the kitchen and keep them in my room so I could throw up. And then when they left, I could flush it down the toilet. That was, so Malta's like an island with a lot, it's like a Catholic island with lots and lots of churches. So I spent a lot of my time in churches on my knees praying, and I took spirit combat, which was a martial arts, and I was doing a lot of fighting in the ocean. And one day I got in these little, this little boat, and there's a little island called Gonzo, and I was paddling over there, over to the island, and I was praying. I was really praying real hard, and then I saw a triple rainbow, and it's like, okay, all right. I still have the strength. I have faith that God is still watching over me. So I stayed sick, but I moved back to the beach and fell in love and got married and became pregnant. And one of the reasons a lot of us tend to recover is because we, are, we want to do it for the child. And it was really hard to recover when I was pregnant, but I, I really, really loved the baby that I was carrying. And I did a lot of praying and a lot of crying and basically had a recovery without finding the, under, the underlying causes. Um, so things were going along pretty well. And the person I married, he developed his own addictions. He started gambling, and I don't know if he was an addict before I met him or not. He came from a good family, a military family, but he got into drugs so bad it was taking everything that we had. I would come home, bicycles would be missing, the kids' toys would be missing, and and he said, well, he was doing construction. He was real smart, but it's, but a lot of times smart people get mixed up in drugs, um, and. We moved into this trailer that he was going to fix up, but it didn't happen that way. I had two small children at this time. I was staying in the trailer that wasn't safe. It had aluminum wiring, holes in the floor, the roof leaked. And we ended up with one car. I was stuck there, kind of isolated. And eventually, I left him, and I got a job pre teaching preschool. That way, I could take care of my children and work at the same time still staying in the trailer. And this whole period that I was staying in the trailer, um, I was relapsing. And it came to the point again where I couldn't even keep spinach down. I couldn't keep anything down. So we'll move to the, the good thing. My life later improved. We, I was at church teaching preschool, and I, don't, I never told anybody about anything that was going on. And a nun came to me one day, and she said, she told me about Habitat for Humanity. And I didn't know I dressed, I thought I dressed okay. I didn't think anybody knew, but God had probably sent her to me. And I eventually got a home through Habitat, and Habitat provides homes for people who are in a certain income bracket. And they have, it's no mortgage interest loan, so you do make payments. And you have to do sweat equity, so you do work to get to your home. Um, but I was still sick um, and keeping it pretty hidden. And then, uh, then I said, when I was lost, I prayed for a map. And when I was lost with a map, I prayed for a guide. And with a guide, directions are easier to follow. So at this point, I'm living in a trailer. My ex-husband, who's still an addict, is coming around. He is really freaking out on me. He's painting my windows, making them close so I can't see out. He's sleeping in my shed, so basically stalking us. And I did have a computer that my in-laws had gave me, and I met Jeannie Ross. She has a PhD, and she owns Marisol, which is a recovery center in Arizona. She walked through me with me every day while this was going on to help me get better. And she helped me understand that the eating disorders um, to learn to challenge 
the eating disorder voice with my healthy voice. And when the eating disorder voice came around, I learned to um, tell it to go away. And I felt like I had um, a multiple personality there. And she explained that the eating disorder is a part of yourself. And it actually was a coping mechanism because I came from a family where there was domestic violence, domestic violence to the point that my brother, who is a police officer, carried on that tradition. And three and a half years ago, he shot and burned his girlfriend two days before they were supposed to get married because she called off the wedding. All this abuse and stuff, I didn't really... I wasn't, they were, they were older than me. They got most of it. By the time I came around, um, there wasn't really a lot of abuse, but that's how it affected them. They carried it on generation to generation to the point that it took somebody's life. Um, but let me move on to today, um, how I eat and stay in recovery. I do attend Celebrate Recovery pretty often. I eat pretty authentically. I just listen to my body and I follow the food pyramid, and I pay attention, and I try to remember to be thankful. I exercise moderately. I do yoga. I walk my dogs. And I learn to live life in the here and now, and that life is very good for me, and I have everything in abundance. I'm a licensed massage therapist and esthetician. I've been doing that for 10 years. I'm also now presently in the human services program, looking for something to do when my hands wear out, something that I have a background and something that I can carry on. And today I believe that the God, God had provided divine intervention, and I know that it was real, and that I will never go back to the sick, sick, self-defeating behaviors that I once lived. And if you have an eating disorder, I just say get help. Um, don't give up. I left some brochures outside. Um, for the last two years, I have volunteered with the National Eating Disorder Society, where what I do basically with that is I'm a navigator. I get people to where they need to be. And that's all I would say. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kevin, and uh, I am a part of several 12-step programs. Um, I uh, was born in Danville, Virginia, um, but I would say my hometown is Winston-Salem, North Carolina. All my family is from there. Um, I, had a fa I had a father that was a work hard, play hard, kind of a functioning alcoholic. His father was a full-blown alcoholic, not in recovery. and. Um, on my mother's side, um, she was one that would have one, maybe possibly two drinks, and there was a little bit of um, mental, there what a little bit of mental disease. That's nice. Um, there's some mental disease on that side, and um, my uncle has um, bipolar disorder as well as I, and then um, there's a cousin on the other side who's a drug addict. And the reason I bring that up is, you know, it it, it is. I believe, I guess in my opinion, in a lot of uh, opinions, it, it is a genetic disorder. There's that predisposition where when I, for me, when I have alcohol or a drug, it just sets something off and it just makes, it just feels, it just feels good. And I wish it didn't a lot, but hopefully uh, I won't have to worry about that anymore. But anyway, so I'm 14 years old and I started playing golf. And in one summer, I went from not really playing to shooting par. I mean, I guess I was an addict to begin with. I literally would practice from 7 in the morning to, to 10 at night. And just that same behavior, that just that repetition. And then I had success, so therefore I kept treating life like that. I, I stayed, I mean, I guess I, I talk about the first drink, but I, I guess I did the old get in the liquor cabinet, pour it all together, add some Coke and call it whatever. Um, didn't really get into it that much. Um, I do remember um, I did play golf. I actually got recruited to play at Coastal Carolina, but I was afraid of coming down here with the beach. But I did play at High Point University, and, um, and when I got there, I kind of felt like I had arrived. I mean, I, when I would drink, I would get that 
warm feeling. I felt like I could. There's no nervousness of meeting anybody. Um, at that point, I could I could somewhat control it. I could drink on the weekends, and that was it. But I was always one of those people that once I started, I just didn't know how to stop, or or I didn't. I just didn't think, didn't understand why you actually would stop. I think that may have been a problem too. But um, I had this idea I wanted to be a golf pro, so I ended up actually going to Mississippi State. And uh, again, being there again was somewhat able to function. Um, again, once I, I just knew when I could start, when I, you know, when I when I could start was was all it was. Um, and then I um, got a good, great job out of, out of college working in um, Birmingham, Alabama. Again, managed to, it's kind of an interesting thing there. The, I'm working at a really nice club called Mountain Brook Club, and the head pro disappeared. And he's in his car contemplating committing suicide for, for three weeks. I just can imagine how somebody's head, and I heard about this mental disease and how the head could go. And I'm like, I'm 20. Three years old, on top, you know, you know, on top of the world or whatever in my mind, and I'm just, I just didn't get it. I mean, he's got these three kids, a wife. He's got this perfect life. I mean, how could he possibly do that? But um, anyway, um, I ended up getting a head pro job in in Anniston, Alabama, at the age of 25. I mean, I guess the next person that interviewed was 40. Um, again, just. You know, that addict, that addictive personality that helped me play golf well help, was helping me at the time. Again, as long as I stayed away from, from, from the drink. Met a, some years later, met a girl in the airport parking ride, moved to Atlanta, was uh, teaching golf there. Um, she didn't drink much, so therefore that relationship didn't last too long. And uh, so, Anyway, I, I, I guess I kind of arrived. I'm 28 years old. Um, had connections with all the bartenders and this and that. And the, I talked golf in Buckhead and all these people that would give me tickets to everything. It seemed like it was a great life. It's, I got to do something fun every week. And slowly, it just to start to see things slip away. I, I mean, I ended up where I just had to drink to function. It's just, it's amazing how just it wasn't to get drunk anymore. It was just a function and like the morning eye opener, things like that, just, just to get through. Um, I uh, attended my first 12-step uh, meeting July 25th, 2005. Um, I remember after about two days sweating in a bed, um, walking, I remember having a Sprite, 20-ounce Sprite. Thank goodness for that because I would have spilled coffee all over the place. Because my hands are probably about like they are now, speaking in front of everybody, and then on the world wide web across the many continents, I'm sure. And, um, but, you know, again, for that, I, I you know, I, I came to that and I felt, I felt like I was at home, meaning that I heard these other people, they, they couldn't sleep either unless they got drunk. And that, I just didn't know, because I didn't know anybody else like that. I mean, I just wasn't in contact or people we didn't. And we didn't talk about that. So that was kind of my first, that, that instance. I got about 45 days, got the girlfriend back that I wanted, and had a, well, try to have, well, I'll just have a glass of wine and off to the races again. Uh, you know, I was on a binge, woke up, never forget this. I mean, I, I, I'll never forget being in my apartment, looking over the place, stuff just, just an absolute mess, and looking up there and just, and closing my eyes, I said, you know, God, I've got absolutely nothing to give anymore. This is, I just, I have nothing. I just felt spiritually bankrupt. And I had kind of a calming feeling. Um, I did, I was able to get off my sofa, went to bed. I did sleep without alcohol. And um, I thought, you know, I just, I, I've got this. So, um, and I, again, I, I lived the 12-step programs in every facet of my life. Um, I, life, life was good. Um, I got right at about three years, I had a sponsee. And it seems like in the 12-step program, we talk a lot about the individual, like maybe a wedding or, or certain things, but I felt like I didn't like know how to ended up in New York City with this gorgeous executive on top of a rooftop uh, bar in Manhattan overlooking the Hudson River in a sunset. And she's like, I'm getting some champagne. What do you want? 
And I'm like, kettle one and tonic. So sure enough, I had the kettle one and tonic, and then, then I was kind of like, rather than just stopping then, I didn't. We dated for a while. It went downhill. Um, and then back to recovery again. So then just failing this, failing that. Um, I could go on and on and on and on. Let's see. Let's sum it up. I... Um, not here to give a drunk a log, but um, but I guess at one time, you know, trying to figure out, I was, I was working at Atlanta, trying to figure out this bipolar disorder thing. I, I knew that I would get, I mean, I wasn't like manic out in the streets like you'd see in the movie, but I would just, I'd buy stupid crap on the internet and just spend all my money, whatever I had. I, um, I just feel like just, like just awesome i mean i haven't really experienced a lot of drugs that you line up but that's kind of what i from what people talk about that's what i felt like and then i'd also feel like just gotten run over by a mac truck so this back and forth type thing and then so then um i'm in atlanta i'm in recovery and i had the flu i ended up losing my job i girlfriend kind of broke up with that added to it just got just a gosh awful depression and um had all these pills around and i just didn't want to be around i was 40 years old i didn't think anybody i mean i didn't i didn't have a, I'd never been married no 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 kids or anything i said i i've lived a full life my dad only made to 46 i've made to 40 i've had a full life and and i just took everything that I could find and um, just didn't want to be wrote the note and um, I woke up I woke up um, I get I, get, I mean I laid down and I guess that my body I threw them up so then um, thought I'd give it another shot and um, that didn't work either and then one more shot which I I had it figured out this time I really did and um, it was kind of weird. I lived on a, I always wanted a place with a view. It's amazing what, what, um, what depression can do. Here I've got this, I'm on the 15th floor, corner place, got this unobstructed view of the city. And I got cardboard over everything because it, it messed with my TV. I couldn't watch TV. I, I just, it was dark. It was just, it was just awful. So anyway, um, had all those this was it. I'm done. Tried to clean up best I could so it wasn't a mess when they found me. But I woke up again and I called my mom and sister. They came and got me. And um, I came to Florence. My sister works in McLeod in Florence. And I um, was in the hospital for a couple days, four days. And then I went to Three Rivers for treatment. And um, yeah, for me, the, the, um, <laughs> the absolute bottom was so I'm in treatment I'm in the, I'm you know in and you know there's like where the you know where my fellow drinkers were but I was in this other side and um, anyway I'm I'll never forget they had all my stuff and a guy named Robert said he had to do a non-invasive search and I'm kind of wondering what that is. So you need to take your you need to take your clothes off. And next scene, I mean, I'm I'm naked in front of another man, and I'm just saying like, how how did I get here? How did I get here? <laughs> I walk out, and there's you know people are walking down the hall, slobbering down their face. Um, they end up being my friends, but still, just like, how did I get here? And you know, the other times waking up. I mean, there's a few times, I mean, obviously, you know, where's my car and that type of stuff. But, but no, I mean, just, you know, how did I get here? I mean, my, my, my mom and dad, they loved me. They, I, everything I wanted within reason, it just, how did I get here? So that, so then I'm, I'm in, I'm in treatment and having gone to a lot of 12 step meetings and hearing some good recovery. And actually the 12 step meetings I went to, every person there had been to multiple treatments so a lot of the lot of that you got a lot of 12 step and you also got a lot of you know cognitive behavioral and you got a lot of the tips that they learned so it was, it was kind of a it's kind of interesting so i'm so i'm i'm so we're doing cognitive behavioral stuff and 
all that, and I'm kind of chipping in, and I've got all these this insight. And I didn't want to, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do golf again because I felt like I kept getting 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 drunk. So um, so anyway, they, they recommended that I be a, a drug counselor. I'm like, okay, this could this could we okay that sounds kind of doable. But I didn't really know, so I get home. I'm researching on the internet. I can't find anything. It's just it's just all over the place. There's not like a, you know, how to be a drug counselor. I didn't find it. It's probably out there now. But I mean, I'm 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 normally a good shot with the. Well, I'll never forget I'm in in the gym. I mean, normally I'll hit. I used to hit like eight, nine, ten out of ten out of ten free throws. I couldn't even hit the rim or something. It was just atrocious what I done done to my body. So um, I'm trying to figure out all this, um, you know, how to be a drug counselor. So one of my calls was actually to hear, and I asked what I needed to do. She said, and I'm two, a week out of treatment, you know, for multiple suicides. I didn't, I didn't mention that on the phone call, by the way. <laughs> so she said, well, you've got your bachelor's. You can get started right away. I'm like, well, I might need some time here. So then I'm like researching, da 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 And then um, I was at a 12-step uh, meeting one morning, and I was just complaining about how, you know, I was, I was a marketing major. And to get your MBA, it's pretty consistent as far as the different programs, da 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 But psychology is a whole other realm. You've got counseling, you've got clinical, you've got school. It's just, it's just all over the place. And I'm just complaining and complaining. As I'm complaining, all these guys are just laughing and they're laughing and they're laughing. Well, hey, we got a professor in the house. <laughs> so this professor, um, you know, told me what I needed to do, which was really helpful. And I got after it. I got my GRE in, personal. I had to get letters of recommendation. I applied to, to graduate school at, at Francis Marion. And um, about a couple of days later, he told me about uh, Casey and what they've got going on here. I'd missed last year. I'm, I, oh, I saw the interventionist online, and I missed the second presenter. But I was here a year ago, sitting about where I was tonight, and I'm up here now. It's uh, you know to think what happened in a year is kind of crazy. Um, so back to. So I applied to Francis Mary, and I was, was able to get in. And um, it's it, it's been it's it, it's just been a whirlwind. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with post-acute withdrawal syndrome, and part of that is short-term memory. I'm learning like this new stuff that I never had. Everybody in my cohort, they're all psychology majors, and I'm not. And um, but the short-term memory, the sleeping, the thinking. I would write papers and I'd go back and read like, who wrote that? Just absolutely nuts. And then, um, so then as I've got to do practicum work, I wanted to work at a substance abuse center. So there's a place called Bruce Hall and it's a detox center. And actually we just started doing inpatient rehab and um, I'm actually doing my practicum now. So. I'm actually the guy now that does the innovative ser searches now, so that's kind of interesting. <laughs> so, wow, what a year it can be. So I guess my uh, clean sobriety date is February the 2nd, 2000, was it 13? <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's, been, it's been about 13 months, and my life is a lot better. Um, it's better because of people like Casey. It's better because of people like my sponsor, Steve. It's better um, for the, it's just, a, it, it's just, it, it's just awesome. And, you know, and the thing that I've noticed too in, in recovery is noticing the similarities rather than the differences. You know, again, my, when I was living in Atlanta, I mean, everybody's my age, look the same, all that stuff. And then here, where I'm going now, I mean, I'm 20 years younger than everybody else, or, or more. But uh, anyway, I probably spoke long enough, and um, that's about it. So I'm just going to close. Thanks for letting me share.
we have time for questions, comments. Okay, let's give them another round of applause. And that's it. Thank you guys for coming. And uh, in a couple of months, I'll start making plans for next year. So if you're on the Facebook page, stay on it. And I'll let you know.